before we get to Jamie, we want, we want <laughs> cut, put cut. it right in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> before we get to Jamie, blah. okay, no. please go check out What's our name again. Com. Who are we? Welcome to the inaugural episode of Bar Down Beauty's podcast, presented by SodaStick.com. I'm Jesse Pierce, writer for The Athletic, NHL.com, and Touchpoint Media, alongside my co-host Alexis Pearson and our fantastic producer, Fred Vineford. Thank you, everybody, for giving us a listen on our very first ever podcast. This is new to all of us. We're very excited to have you on board and uh, giving us a whirl here, just so you know what you're getting yourselves into with Bar Down Beauties. We will be a weekly podcast Featuring three different segments, including special guests, a hockey hot topic in NHL Minute, and a state of hockey story that brings everything back here to Minnesota. The goal is to bring both unique stories, as well as the familiar favorites and some hockey X's and O's, all capped off with a fun female perspective. Um, don't forget you can find Bar Down Beauties on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You can also give each Alexis and I an individual follow on our Twitter and Instagram from there. Well, I think that's enough of me. Let's meet Alexis Pearson, member of the Minnesota Wild Radio Network and color commentator for the NWHL reigning champs, the Minnesota Whitecaps. Alexis, let's go. Can you believe that we're here today doing this? Because about, what, a month ago, this was, you know, not even a thing. This was an idea. And here we are today recording. And that's kind of crazy, don't you think? (laughs) It's kind of crazy. I mean, we both laughed. We had no idea what we were doing, but we wanted to do it. So we ordered a bunch of stuff on Amazon and uh, decided to give it a shot. Gotta love the two-day shipping because that allows (laughs) us to uh, turn a quick switch here and uh, start recording, which... It's been fun so far. It's been a whirlwind. Things have gone quickly, and I can't believe that we're already at the point in time where we're recording episode one. I know. Pretty soon, people are going to be listening to this. They're listening right now. Exactly. <laughs> Again, we're, we're excited to have you on board. Alexis and I, uh, both from kind of different ends of the spectrum, I'm a little bit older, have been in this industry for, for a little bit here, and Alexis is just starting out, so it's going to be a, a fun uh, banter that we have going yeah and Jesse you're more on the writing side of the sports community I'm more on the broadcasting side of the sports community I just graduated college in May uh, from St. Cloud State I'm sure somebody listening is probably a Husky there's always somebody else out there who also went to St. Cloud Um, and yeah it's been it's been a crazy you know six seven months since I graduated and get to do lots of cool stuff like this which is always fun she just graduated college. I graduated in 2010. I have no idea where you were at that time. I but think starting middle school, maybe. <laughs> Jeez, now I feel incredibly old. Um, yeah, Iowa State Cyclone. I found out that you could get paid to do sports. I don't know how you decided to do It's one of the career. coolest epiphanies you have as a child <laughs> is when you realize that you can do something fun and get paid to do it. I know that's how I felt when I realized that this was an actual job option and it wasn't just, you know, celebrities on TV doing stuff. It's like, whoa, okay, so those are real people. They have real lives and I can be one of those people someday if I want to be. Exactly. And And then here we are. It's not the glamorous life that maybe most think it is. Um, (laughs) It's certainly not uh, as fancy as they show it on TV. It's it's fun. It's definitely a unique lifestyle. And I know that's what I always tell people when they ask, like, do you like doing that? You know, is it fun? Like people always think, oh, it's so cool. You get to be around the athletes and talk to the athletes. And it's like, yeah, it's a lot of fun, but it's also crazy in, in the best way possible. You know, you're working crazy hours. You're when everyone else is going home to eat dinner with their families, you're heading to the rink or to the field or whatever it is you're doing for work that day. And it's such a fun lifestyle. And I think the coolest part about working in this industry and with this community is that it's something new every day. You know, you're not going to work and sitting at a desk and filing paperwork and, you know, you do that eight hours a day, five days a week. Every day is fun. Uh, Every game is something exciting and new and the players are fun to talk to. And, you know, the other writers and broadcasters in the community are so fun to be around. And 
I never get sick of it. At least not yet. Uh, granted, I'm young and th- I'm still very early in this career. And maybe at some point I'll get Give sick it of it. Time. But I'm not jaded just yet. Like, I'm having uh, fun now. Yeah. No, it is. It's it's one of the most fun careers there really is. But it is work. It's a lot of work. I have to constantly remind my friends I'm not in the press box drinking a beer and saying go wild by any means. It's uh, I wish. It, yeah, right? Once in a while, especially with some of those games. But <laughs> yeah. um, no, it's definitely work. We're very, very fortunate to be in it. Um, and hockey players are the uh, the best players to work with. I think I've done dabbled in football and some different sports, so very privileged and and honored to uh, to make this a, a career of ours. Well, and Jesse, I think what a lot of people want to know when you work in sports is, did you grow up playing sports? Did you grow up watching sports? You know what what got you into this career? Because in a way, it is you know a little glamorous, and you you know especially if you're doing on on air stuff or if you're physically around the athletes, people are like you know what made you want to do that. And I know I grew up in a hockey community. I went to South St. Paul High School, uh, which is uh, just south of St. Paul. It's an, epon- an eponymous name, so it's uh, very close to the Twin Cities, and that was a big hockey town. Um, and so I grew up with uh, going to hockey games and you know always skating, doing something. But I never played the sport of hockey. And I know Jesse, you're the same too. Which a lot of people are like, how did you even want to do this if you (laughs) never even played? I just, I grew up loving sports and I always said that work should be fun and shouldn't feel like work, shouldn't feel like a job and, you know, getting paid to do something that feels fun is a great experience. Exactly. Yeah. I grew up playing sports myself. Uh, Matamidai Zephyr here, go Zephs. (laughs) Um, But my mom is from International Falls and my dad's from Hill Murray, two very hockey centric towns. And so I just kind of became a hockey fan in that sense and full discretion had a crush on a hockey boy in seventh (laughs) grade and decided I should probably learn the sport to get him to notice me dropped the boy kept the game worked out wonderfully it's Um, the best way that could have gone right (laughs) exactly (laughs) it's the way I would choose every time um but yeah it is I mean it's hard to be from Minnesota anywhere in Minnesota and Mm -hmm. avoid the game of hockey and, and recognize the love and the passion for it so that's exactly how I got my start too just having fun, loving sports. And, and look, here we are still talking <laughs> yeah. today, right? Well, and I know too, like, especially as a woman, you know, I, we talked about how I'm a little bit younger than you. And I know when I was a kid, there wasn't that many female broadcasters who were big names on TV, especially in sports. And when I was, you know, the wild didn't become a hockey team until I was five. So for the first five years that I existed in this world, the Minnesota did not have a, a national hockey team. So the North stars were still a thing when yes. I was around. <laughs> so, um, I didn't even start getting into hockey until the wild came around. Um, but I remember, you know, watching hockey games when I was younger and Marnie Gellner was the first female I remember watching on TV with sports and thinking, Oh my God, that is so cool. I want to do that for a job. Like I didn't know girls could do that. I didn't know that was a thing. And she was the first one I remember watching. And then as I got older, you know, there was other females in other sports and in hockey in general or Fox Sports North, all these different um, areas that I was watching sports and seeing females. And it became more and more of a dream. And I'm someone who knew I wanted to do this since I was probably 10, 11 years old. I mean, I never at any point really wanted a different job in my life. I don't know about you, Jesse, but Mm -hmm. um, when I was young, it was still a bit of a dream to be a woman in sports. And now that I'm actually doing and I'm like, wow, I, you know, that's pretty cool that for a moment, you know, I wondered if it was going to be possible to do that or to be successful in that. And the more opportunities that come along and the more things I get to do, I'm like, this is the best career I could have picked because I'm having so much fun doing it. Absolutely. And I mean, you mentioned Fox Sports North. I know we both have interned there yep. and there were the ladies that <laughs> paved the way and Carol for me, um, took me under her wing and, and did Vikings Weekly. I remember She said, okay, today you're interviewing Adrian Peterson. I was like, oh, okay, and just panic for a 20-year-old at the time. (laughs) Um, But, you know, and ironically, our first guest for this episode, Miss Jamie Hirsch, um, fellow Minnesotan, who is now uh, putting Minnesota on the map uh, with (laughs) the NHL Network, um, but had gotten a good bump along from Fox Sports North. So we're very excited to have Jamie as our inaugural guest. It's fitting another female paving the way and and doing some big things. Yeah. And she was somebody that I remember watching too, as I got a little bit older. Um, and I was so sad when she left, obviously Audra is great and we're so happy she's here too, but that was so tough to watch Jamie leave. And uh, because she was someone I really admired and she makes watching sports fun. And we talk about that in the interview with her a little bit too, but man, she's so good at her job and it really sets the bar for other females in the business to, you know, 
be their best and do their best and be smart hockey journalists and smart sports journalists because that's, you know, and she talks about that too, but that's a big thing with our job is, you know, all the behind the scenes stuff. Everybody sees the glamorous part <laughs> where we're in the locker room interviewing people or, you know, we're on TV or you're reading an article one of us wrote, but it's all that prep that goes into it that makes the job so rewarding because not everybody sees that side of it. And for the record, folks should know the locker room stinks. It it's does. sweaty. You're bumping into each other. You can't yep. step on the logo. So <laughs> yeah. you're not missing out on much, guys. I rules. promise. <laughs> yeah. Before we get to Jamie, we want to remind our listeners that Bar Down Beauties is sponsored by SodaStick.com. They actually just teamed up with the Herb Brooks Foundation to unveil a new online collection devoted to Herb Brooks and the 1980 Olympic team. Be sure to check out the hand-drawn Herb Brooks tribute artwork. A portion of the sales from that collection will be going straight to the foundation. Also, make sure you use promo code BARDOWNBEAUTIES for free shipping on any order at SodaStick.com. They've got some awesome merchandise, guys. Definitely yeah, give we, them Yeah, we were look. just looking at the website now like, <laughs> I want this and I want this. So And I have this and yes. I have this. So it's it's a great place. Give them a, give them a love. Now joining us, one of our very favorite Minnesotans, making the state of hockey look good on the NHL Network, Miss Jamie Hirsch. Jamie, thank you so much for uh, jumping on with Bardown Beauties today. Yes, I'm so excited to hear that this podcast is a reality and that I get to be a part of the inaugural episode. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's hard not to to think of you. You're out there making us look good. And actually, uh, I know jaded Minnesota Wild fans might not be thrilled to hear where you are right now, but you're actually in Dallas getting ready for the Winter Classic. How's that going? Yeah, I can't wait. Um, I actually have not been to the Winter Classic in person since my first year working at MHL Network when it was in Foxborough where the Patriots play. Um, and that was just really special to be there. You know, you always think about the snow and the ice and New Year's Day and hockey. Um, and this is going to be a little different because we aren't expecting snow that I'm aware of. I certainly hope not because I'm not really taxed to that. Um, but I... And I'm very much looking forward to a totally different feel of the Winter Classic. You know, the, it's so much about the history of the game. But these two teams are relatively new franchises in terms of, you know, the Stars, older franchise, but newer location uh, for them. And then the Predators, too, an expansion team. So uh, I know there's a kind of a different energy and a, a fun vibe with both of these teams getting the chance to be on the biggest stage in hockey. Now, Jamie, you get to go to a lot of cool places um, with your job, but you're from Minnesota originally, a Champlain Park native. Um, your first big job out of college was working in Wisconsin, but then you got to come home to Minnesota and work at Fox Sports North. So talk a little bit about, you know, how cool that was to have your first big gig kind of back where you grew up. Oh, it was a dream come true. It really was. And I'm very happy where I am now, but I will always say that, you know, that was, the dream job um, initially was to, to go cover the teams that I grew up cheering for in terms of the Wild and um, the, the Timberwolves and obviously the Minnesota Twins as well. Um, and so it was just so special to be able to come home and have those experiences where I got to be up close and personal with some of the, the biggest names in our state's history. You know, Paul Mulder getting to know him, Corey Hunter getting to know him, um, Zach Parisi, him too. So that was really cool. And then from a personal standpoint, it was awesome to have my, my whole family and friends be able to watch me do what I, I love to do. Because before I was in Madison, Wisconsin, and nobody got Madison cable or local news or local sports or anything. And so um, to be home and, and have everyone there, my support system really there to cheer me on and kind of help me figure out everything as I went, because there was a learning curve. Um, that was really special for me. Do you remember getting the call for the NHL Network? And was that kind of always the goal to go national with, with it, obviously, in broadcasting? I think the goal was always to go national. I had no idea that it would be with NHL Network or MLB Network. Um, and that ended up just being so serendipitous because I did both baseball and hockey. I covered both sports when I was in Minnesota. And so when MLB Network kind of took on NHL Network in the summer of 2015, they were just trying to start this network pretty much from the ground in terms of talent. They were looking for new hosts and a couple of new analysts. And so they were just thinking, okay, we only have a few months before the season starts. Who knows hockey? Who could we go out there and get? And I had actually done some work on a freelance basis for MLB Network covering the Twins. 
and I was kind of their twins correspondent. And so it was very serendipitous that it all came together at the right time. They knew I also covered hockey. And so I, I came in for the audition. And kind of a fun story that a lot of people might not know, I actually auditioned four times <laughs> at MLK <laughs> Network before I got the job um, over the course of three or four years. And my first audition, I was pretty much right out of college. I think they did it as a favor to my agent, honestly, <laughs> because I really <laughs> wasn't ready for the national scene. But I went there. It was great experience. Again, I was totally in over my head, but it was such good experience for me to go there and experience um, the thrill and nerves of auditioning for a national network. And then I came back later, and then I went back later. And, and each time, I kind of got a little closer to getting the job, but there just wasn't quite the right fit for me is, is what they told me at the time. And so when this hockey piece of the puzzle came into play, um, I thought, okay, well, this time, I mean, I'm, I'm very clearly a good fit here. And if this doesn't work out, then I'm never coming back, you know, <laughs> kind of thing, like clearly this isn't meant to be. So luckily when I did go in, you know, it went very well and um, I had a really good feeling about it. And it was about a week later that they called and, and offered me the job, and I was so happy. Um, I Ironically, I happened to be in Madison, Wisconsin at the time, the place where I got my first job in television. And I was there because my husband was still working there, and so I was there um, for a work conference with him and just visiting. And I was super nostalgic, thinking, oh, my gosh, I, I made it to the national level, and I drove by my old little lo local news station and took a picture outside and sent it to my parents. I mean, this is all very sappy, but that's kind of <laughs> where I was at the time in terms of kind of being overwhelmed by the past and, and um, the fact that my dream kind of came true, as cheesy as that sounds. No, that's awesome. Yeah, and you, you kind of touched on it a bit, but I mean, clearly it was meant to be if you have ended up now on the national stage, but what does your typical day look like at NHL Network? Obviously, I'm sure there's a lot of similar things to what you did at Fox Sports North um, and even when you were working in Madison, but what does your typical day look like there? It is actually very different than either of my first two jobs in the sense that uh, we just have so many resources and so many people that work behind the scenes to really make my job a lot easier. You know, in Madison, I was doing it all. I was a one-man band, so to speak, and, you know, shooting, editing, um, doing my own stand-up, and back and putting it all together and reporting it on the news that night. Now, uh, I'm very lucky where I pretty much just have to focus on the presentation of it. But in that also comes preparation. And so I would say, um, you know, my normal show is on the fly. It's a late night highlight show. So I typically don't go into work until about 7 p.m. And I get home around 2 or 3 a.m. <laughs> after all the West Coast games have finished and we've done our show. So the preparation starts sometime in the afternoon. Uh, usually, you know, I'll start reading game previews and seeing what's on the schedule for the night in terms of any big storylines. And then the producer and I will start uh, an email exchange, kind of what we're thinking should be you know, the lead of the show or, you know, an on-camera story where we really flesh out the stories of that night. So that'll start sometime in the afternoon, just a quick email exchange. We have a whole team of researchers that puts out a daily research packet, which is very helpful to help us keep track of all 31 teams and what the storylines even are. Um, and so that's really helpful. We can kind of pan over that, highlight relevant bullet points, whatever. And then I go in around 7. I write all the on-camera scripts that I'm going to read later that night um, in terms of setting the scene kind of for the highlight. And then from there, it's a matter of watching the games and um, doing the highlights. And so that's what I think is just so cool is the number of people that goes into creating our show on a daily basis is really amazing. Um, from the people that just watch the games to figure out which highlights to use, then to the editors that edit those highlights, and then to the producers that script out you know, where they go in the show, um, and then my part is the fun part, I think, where I just get to present the highlights. And that's what you see every night and into the morning, too. And I think the most rewarding part of my job is going to these big events um, like the All-Star Game, like the Winter Classic, the Stanley Cup Final, and running into kids 
who say, I walk through every morning before school. <laughs> because that's a, a really great thing to hear that, you know, hockey fans are tuning in to find out what happened when they had to go to bed. So I'm the person that gets to stay up late <laughs> and watch <laughs> so that they can know what happened. <laughs> I mean, how do you handle that with being a mama then too? I know I've got two little ones and those late night games can be a bit exhausting because the little ones don't, uh, don't care that you didn't sleep in necessarily. <laughs> how do you balance exactly. um, the motherhood and, and this career? It is a big challenge. And, you know, I was lucky that my son Brooks was born um, at the end of April. So by the time the hockey season started, he was about five and a half months old. So by then he was sleeping really well, and I was—I am still the first to say I'm just very lucky <laughs> as a parent that I have a really good sleeper because he really does sleep about 11 to 12 hours a night, which is very, very helpful. Wow! So yeah, yeah. I'm also lucky that um, we have for now. My husband's actually using his paternity leave, and he's about to go back um, to work. But he still had a, a bunch of paternity leave that he saved until hockey started. Um, and so he has been really great about taking our baby in the morning when he wakes up at 6.30 so that I can sleep, you know, until I get at least like six or seven hours. Um, and then, you know, it's fun because then I get to be mom all day and then I go in again when he's already down at seven o'clock at night. So it's been a really good balance so far. When my husband goes back, I think we're going to have um, someone come to the house in the morning uh, like a nanny and, and help us out just for a few hours, just so that I can, again, get a little bit of sleep. Uh, but it's always <laughs> it's an ever-changing goal and ever-changing target to get enough sleep as a new parent, for sure. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. That is, that's very lucky. I think I was also fortunate. My little one slept, so that makes all the difference. You need all the rest you can get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. I don't have little ones yet, but I hope to someday. So hearing these stories from other women in the industry who have families and have kids is always something I look forward to um, because I know it's a challenge to be a mom in general, uh, let alone to uh, have a booming career. Um, and kind of touching on that, we, you know, we're all women in this industry and um, we've done a lot of different things uh, between the three of us, uh, a lot of cool stories we all have and something we all have to talk about at some point and get asked is, you know, what it's like to be a woman in this industry. And Jamie, I know you've touched on this before. You've talked about this a lot, but you know, what challenges have you felt uh, in this industry being a woman? Um, and, you know, especially with like social media nowadays too, it, it can be tough to kind of, um, you know, keep moving forward and have confidence in yourself when sometimes it feels like the world's against you a little bit. Yeah, I think it's hard for, for anyone in the spotlight or in the public eye um, just to, to deal with the pressures of, of trying to be perfect while coming across as natural and relatable and all of that. So it is a balancing act. Um, I, I'm the first to, to admit that you know I'm not perfect. And in fact, I really like to have fun and kind of be goofy and imperfect on shows like On the Fly. Um, and so that helps with that pressure a little bit, but I just go back to preparation. You know, I think credibility is, is the biggest thing that you can have, especially as a woman in sports. And it takes so long to build that up and it takes one misstep to tear it down. And so that goes back into the preparation. And um, I just, I take a, a real sense of responsibility for kind of all women or the future of women in sports in the sense that, I don't want to mess up because I don't want someone to see that and say, oh, see, she's a woman. She shouldn't be talking about hockey. She clearly doesn't know what she's saying. Mm -hmm. And so I, I never want to give anyone a reason to think that. So it just takes a little bit more work on my part. But I think that's, that's good, you know, and, and I come across more prepared that way. I feel more confident in what I'm saying because I know I'm right because I did the work. I put in the, the hours that it takes to make sure that, you know, I know how to pronounce a player's name or – I know which team is actually doing well right now, and I'm not just mailing it in and reading a teleprompter. So I think um, that's where I, I fall on uh, whenever I, I try to, you know, feel like I, I know what I'm talking about. I mm -hmm. just go back and I, I read more or I talk to more players um, whenever we get the chance at these big events. And then, you know, you, you have these conversations that you can then later – rely on and say, well, you know, when I got to talk to Tyler Sagan at the Winter Classic, he was telling me that they were really working on the power play, for example. You know, I'm making this up right now, but it's just something where <laughs> anytime you can have that kind of in your back pocket, um, you you just sound like a more credible source. So there are challenges to being a woman in sports, but 
if, if you're the most prepared that you can be, then um, it doesn't matter if you're male or female. I think you will gain that credibility. Right. Well, I think that's what a lot of people uh, who aren't in the TV journalism industry don't understand is that all that behind the scenes work that you put in, you know, we don't show up and read prompters. We don't, you know, I mean, sometimes we do, that is part of the job, but there's so much preparation, so much, you know, ad libbing and bantering that's not scripted um, that a lot of people don't think about. And so a lot of people will just jump on quick mistakes because they're like, Oh, they can't read a prompter. Or they did, you know, they didn't do this, but it's like, there's, you know, a whole right. day worth of preparation you're doing to, to put on a good show. And I mean, that's something I've always admired about, you know, watching you on TV is, is, you know, how much fun you have with it. And that's something I've always tried to emulate um, in my broadcasting career because I think those people are the most fun to watch. They, you know, you can tell they know what they're talking about. And, and if they're having fun, I'm having fun watching it. So Right. Exactly. And you yeah, look like you're having so much fun. <laughs> yeah, I think I just um, sang a, a version of Hall and Oates when we talked about Taylor Hall <laughs> and Hall and Yost going to Arizona. And I mean, that was maybe peak ridiculousness in my career, but it was really fun. Um, and I'm lucky to work with a group of people that support my uh, silly, <laughs> creative <laughs> notions from time to time. Um, but it is, I, I totally, I love what you're saying. I totally agree um, with the fact that if I'm watching somebody who's having fun on air, I'm having fun watching them. And at the end of the day, I think, you know, we all want to just realize that we work in sports. You know, it's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. Like, we get to watch sports and talk about it for a living. And so why not? have fun with it. <laughs> exactly. Oh, absolutely. And you know, you talked about credibility and the research that we have to put into it just to make it seem, you know, we do know our stuff. You never played the game. Alexis and I actually never played the game either. I mean, is part of that you're just you're a fan of the game, so it's easy to soak up all of the knowledge that you possibly can and and just read it, really ready yourself to get out there and talk about it. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. Um, you know, I I go back to the fact that um in any job, I would hope that you would put in that amount of work and preparation. And so for me, you know, when I, I first got the job at Fox Sports North, I did not have any hockey experience, really. And it's funny because I think a lot of people just assume that I grew up playing or at least knew about it um, being in Minnesota. But as most people in Minnesota will know, Champlin, where I grew up, doesn't actually have a very vibrant hockey community. And so while it is the state of hockey and we're very proud of it. Um, there are pockets that are more of a hockey hotbed than others. And my school was much more football, basketball, volleyball. Um, and so those are the sports that I knew most, baseball included. Um, so I, I don't openly broadcast this because, you know, it's in my best interest for people to think, oh, yeah, she definitely knows hockey <laughs> since day one. But if I'm being honest, I really didn't until I got the job with the Wild. And then I said, oh, my gosh, I need to learn hockey. <laughs> so I remember I had to give 30 days notice to my former company, and I had 30 days to learn hockey. <laughs> Basically, I, I bought the NHL Network cable package. I DVR'd anything I could in terms of games, um, pre-game shows, post-game shows, whatever I could watch to try to you know figure out the lingo and the rules and the names of the players. And then what basically was my best teacher was just experience. And by that, I mean going into the job at Fox Sports North and listening and soaking up and asking questions, um, learning as much as I could while on the job. Um, so I, I kept my questions pretty generic. And <laughs> I had some very gracious analysts, um, including Wes Wells and Tom Chunky, Ben Clymer, um, the late Doug Lug. And they were all so great about, um, you know, not judging me, but instead just patiently, you know, kind of explaining things to me off camera or, um, and, and I, I would just say, yeah, I asked a lot of questions and I tried to soak up as much knowledge in the shortest amount of time I could. What's the hardest name that you've had to pronounce or any names that you still kind of struggle with at all? <laughs> I actually, I love this name though, because I practiced it so much my first year, <laughs> but Vladislav Mesnikov was one of my <laughs> That's a good one. favorites. Yeah. I would yeah, I was kind of panicked when I saw it on the <laughs> shot sheet of the highlight initially, but then now, you know, I practice it so much that now it's one of my favorites. <laughs> Now, Jamie, we've gone through kind of the whole timeline here. We've talked about where you started. We've talked about present day at NHL Network. So I guess we've just got one final question. Where do you see the future of the industry going, uh, especially for us females in this business? I think 
that the future is very bright. I think we're seeing so many more women in sports now, whether it's on camera or especially off camera. I love um, places like the athletic and Jesse, I think you're part of the athletic too, right? I am. Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of everywhere right now. <laughs> you can't escape me yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. And that's, they're one of my favorite outlets um, for information and really deeper stories um, than you might get otherwise. And I feel like there are some really talented female writers that have jumped on board there who I love following and getting their perspective. Um, and I think it's important to get females that aren't just on camera because then it, it just hammers home the point that it's not just because we're a pretty face on TV that we're on TV. You know, no, we're, we're working in sports because we love sports, whether it's on camera or um, as a, a director behind the scenes, as a producer, uh, as a researcher, whatever it may be, I do think the one area that I'd really like to see growth, um, specifically in the female spectrum, is uh, in the play-by-play role. You know, we we now have several women doing play-by-play for football, both college and professional, which I think is awesome. Uh, I really think it's time to have a female play-by-play uh, in hockey. I think that would be really, really awesome. Uh, just another step forward because I think a, a powerful part of what we do is is setting the example for future generations. And part of the reason why I ended up wanting to go into sports was because I grew up watching the Celtic Boya on, I think it was Monday Night Football at the time, and that she was working with. Uh, and I remember thinking, wow, she really knows what she's talking about. And that's really cool because she obviously didn't play football, but she – is really good at her job and she works on TV talking about football. And I was a huge Vikings fan growing up. Um, and so I remember kind of thinking I could do that. And the reason I thought that was because I saw another woman doing that. So I think if, if we see, if more young girls see someone who looks like them uh, on TV or in a role that they think, Oh, I could do that. That's a really powerful uh, concept and so if we have more women play by play you know I never people have just recently started asking me would you ever do play by play and I said what no like, I never even thought about that and then the more I started getting asked that the more I thought why haven't I thought about that that would actually be really great and really fun so now I am not quite ready I don't think I mean I, I, I guess you are ready by getting reps and doing it so maybe I'll have a chance to someday and that would be great but I think that that was a really interesting thing that I had to realize is like I never thought about it because I never had an example of someone doing it. So that would be really cool to see uh, a woman in that role. If you have any questions, uh, Miss Alexis actually does play by play here as well. I do mostly color, but I've I've dabbled in play by play for the White Caps. So I know I had a similar experience as you, Jamie, growing up. I mean, the Wild weren't a team until I was five years old, so I didn't start watching hockey until you know the Wild <laughs> came around. Um, but I remember Marnie Gellner was actually the woman for me that I remember watching on TV and thinking, "Holy Aww. cow, that's really cool! Women can do that. I want to do that." Um, and I think yeah. a lot of females have that experience. Yeah, that's so cool that you're doing that for the white caps. And I, I certainly didn't mean that women aren't doing that anywhere. I just at the NHL level. Yeah, so, no, yeah, yeah. That is a really great, that is, is very great. And, you know, hopefully um, we start to see more and more of that. And I do love that we, we are seeing, like, Kendall Coyne is an analyst for us yep. now. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that is really validating to see women as analysts too because it's a good reminder that oh yeah women do play this sport (laughs) and they can obviously talk about hockey no matter if they didn't play in the NHL if they played in the NWHL or if they won a gold medal for goodness sake Mm -hmm. I mean it's really cool to see them more as analysts too um but I I think yeah play by play is one area that I'd love to see in NHL play by play women soon I love it. Well, let's do it, ladies. I think we can uh, get get rolling or hopefully inspire some some young little girls to to jump into that role. I think that'd yeah. be really exciting. Well, again, Jamie, thank you so much for, for joining us. We can't wait to have you on again. Um, listeners, don't forget that you can watch host and reporter Jamie Hirsch throughout NHL Network's live coverage of the 2020 Bridgestone Winter Classic on site from Dallas. Jamie, thank you so much. Thanks, Jamie. Yes, thank you. Talk to you soon.
Not to conclude on a sour note, but on December 14th, the Minnesota hockey community lost a legend in Doug Woog. Woog was a man of many words, never short a story, and synonymous with gopher hockey and South St. Paul hockey. We had Jamie Hirsch talk about her experiences, along with South St. Paul native Alex Stalock sharing some of his stories of this icon. You mentioned Doug Woog, and unfortunately, we you know recently lost him. What are some of your fondest memories of working with Wooger, and, and what do you uh, recall about him? I just remember thinking this guy is the nicest human that I've had the chance to work with because in a business with egos and especially in sports where people tell you all the time that you're such a superstar or, you know, you, you are such a big deal because you play the game for a living or you were a coach like he was for a living. Um, he didn't have an ego. He would stop and talk to any person, whether, you know, a drunk college student at the game <laughs> or an old time, fan, like long time fan that wanted to talk about her books or something. I mean, they would, he would stand there and talk to them without any sort of, of rush or anything, no matter how close we were getting to our show, to the point where I would sometimes have to step in and say, Wooger, we got to go around and <laughs> come over here. But that's just such a, that's who he was. You know, he just wanted to talk to people and share his experiences and his stories and answer their questions. Um, and that was the biggest thing that stood out to me about him. Hey, yeah, he's South St. Paul. Uh, obviously, growing up, I played at Wakona Arena, and it's now Doug Wooger Arena. So that says a lot about not just the guy he did, was in, in hockey, the, the coaching he accomplished, all the milestones. It's the person he was. And um, when you shook his hand and uh, talked with him, he had all, all the respect of, uh, of a person, you know. He was an unbelievable leader, what he did at the University of South St. Paul. Um, along the way, he was an incredible man, and I think it was about a year ago I got to see him and uh, spend some quality time uh, sitting down with him, and, uh, you know, I appreciate it every time I got to uh, see Doug. I sat down with him, actually. It was, uh, my, uh, it was a cousin's graduation party, and I had no idea who was going to be there. And so I ended up sitting at uh, one of the uh, tables with him for a while. And um, at that time, you know, I think it was easiest for him to sit down anyway, so he would rather. And it was good. He was, uh, when he gets going on a story or you can get him on a story, it was something that he could still go on pretty good. And, you know, he was at, uh, he helped out at university when I was trying to make, University of Minnesota when I was making my college decision. And, Ultimately, I chose Duluth, but uh, every time we played Minnesota, whether it was at the deck or in Minnesota, he came over, made a point to come and grab me out of the room and mm -hmm. spent a few minutes with me just to ask how things were going. And um, I always shared a joke. Um, he allowed me to work at his camps in the summers whenever I wanted, even though I was a University of Minnesota guy. And, uh, you know, he just uh, he really took care of us all St. Paul guys. I think my cousin Adam would say the same thing. Justin Falk would say the same thing. He, had, uh, he really had a passion for the Bruno White. That was Alex Daylock speaking right after we found out about Woog's passing on that December 14th game when Minnesota beat the Philadelphia Flyers 4-1. Um, the, hence the locker room <laughs> audio. I'm sure you guys maybe heard quite a bit of noise. That's that's what the locker room's like. Um, is, some yes. kiddos playing in the background. But like Alex said, he really supported the the maroon and gold at, with the Gophers, but also the maroon and white, the South St. Paul. Alexis, you're from South St. Paul. Talk about what he really meant in that community. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned it at the beginning of the of the show here, but South St. Paul is a huge hockey community. I mean, you, you can't grow up in South St. Paul and not know those big hockey names. Doug Woog is a name I've known for <laughs> as long as I can remember. And, you know, uh, Alex touched on it in, in uh, his quotes there. But it, Wakota Arena, when they changed it to Doug Woog Arena, I mean, that was a huge moment for the community in South St. Paul because, A, you know, everyone knew Wakota Arena. I know it took me a while to like start calling it <laughs> Doug Woog Arena because I grew up and it's like, oh, that's Wakota. That's Wakota. We're going to Wakota. But it's a huge honor to have it named after him. And, you know, it's it just goes to show you how big of a difference he made in that community. And, you know, I never talked to him personally. I just knew who he was because I grew up in South St. Paul. And he was a big member of not only the South St. Paul community, but the hockey community. Um, and, you know, everybody knew who he was. And I know when, when we found out the news on the night that he passed that it was a big, you know, big deal for this community, the hockey community. Um, and I know, you know, friends from South St. Paul Paul. We're posting about it on social media because it was just, you know, such big news. And we had a moment of silence for him at the Wild game. I think it was the next home mm -hmm. game after that. Uh, the Whitecaps did a moment of silence for him at their game the next day. So uh, to lose a guy like that in the hockey community is so huge, especially in a, in a state and a community that really values its hockey and its its members um, in that community. So really tough to hear of, of the news of his passing. Um, but it's really nice to hear people say such good things about him mm -hmm. um, and just goes to show how, um, how much 
he meant to this community. He absolutely did. I know we spoke with Pat Micheletti as well, who had played for Doug, and he talked about his own experiences with him um, as far as being a player, and he admitted him and Doug didn't quite see (laughs) eye to eye at the beginning, Um, but he said the thing that Doug really did was push him to work and and become the player that, that he did when he was there at the U, and the successes that Doug had, I mean, that can't be understated. He was a very successful coach. I know he didn't ever win that coveted national title, but I mean, you look at his coaching record and it's it's unbelievable what he had done with that program and, and in recruiting just Minnesota guys and really bringing the state of hockey here. I mean, you're from Minnesota, you're going to go play for the U and Doug Woog. And uh, it was just what a remarkable man. I've, I've only heard great things again like you. I didn't personally know him. Yeah. I, you know, obviously know of him and, and who he was. So um, very unfortunate here of his passing and our hearts go out to Doug and his family and friends. Well, and I think that's even more of a testament to the kind of person he was that he didn't necessarily reach some of those goals that you would hope for in his kind of position or as a community. And the fact that everyone still adores him and respects him and all of those things just goes to show how truly good of a person he was and how much he was valued in the hockey community. Absolutely. Well, that'll do it for this week's edition of Bar Down Beauties. Thanks again to everyone for tuning in, especially on this this first show. Hopefully <laughs> uh, you keep coming back for more. We plan to, again, release these weekly to everybody, um, covering a variety of topics and putting some fun personal spins on it with some great guests and uh, unique storylines and, and hockey do's and don'ts and X's and O's and all of that good stuff. Um, thanks to uh, Alexis and our producer, Fred Vinefort, for making us sound too legit to quit. Thanks, Fred. <laughs> You're the best, Fred. <laughs> uh, be sure to subscribe and not miss an audio beat of each and every ep- episode. Talk to you, Buttes, next week. Mm-hmm.